Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jack Douglas. When people who travel a lot speak of the really complete vacation, they mean a vacation that offers relaxation, entertainment, natural wonders, and scenic beauty, and a chance to learn something of the history and traditions of the place being visited by the people who live here now and those who were here before them. Well, that's precisely the kind of armchair vacation we have in store for us during the next 30 minutes as we leave our cares behind and take off on an Arizona holiday. When the desert sky has been painted pink by the fading sun, the residents of Phoenix drive some 20 miles northeast of Phoenix to a most unique restaurant, the Pinnacle Peak Patio. Now, the regular customers wear sports shirts without neckties because here's what happens to unsuspecting city slickers. Good evening. Hello, Welcome to Pinnacle Peak Patio. Uh, oh, through the goodness. rules of the house are the ties allowed. You have a chance to put it in your pocket or I'll cut it off and add it to our collection. Oh, I think you might as well oh. be yeah, cut off. Well, after much cheering, the necktie will be tacked to the ceiling. Now, this custom started when a group of TV cameramen from Manhattan finished an assignment locally and celebrated by cutting off their neckties and hanging them to the rafters. And today at Pinnacle Peak, you'll see neckties from all over the world, Australia, Dublin, East Africa, India, Arabia. Would you like to add it to our collection or put it in your pocket? Well, I believe I'd like to add it to your place. Wonderful. There's more than the necktie fun ritual to attract the sightseer to Pinnacle Peak. Two cowpokes work at a feverish pace to keep up with the demand for two-pound T-bone steaks. Now, the price of these mammoth charbroiled steaks plus a pint of beans and salad is only three fifty. And just another reason why Pinnacle Peak does not advertise, yet everybody in Arizona knows about it. This attractive miss has ordered her steak medium rare. Her date wanted his well done, and this is what they gave him. Pinnacle Peak, a mountain dinery that's become a sightseer's must. This building in Tucson headquarters more Arizona charm, and the man responsible is Mr. Eduardo Casso. 25 years ago, combining the love of teaching with the love of singing, I created the Tucson Boys Chorus. From white shirts and colored sashes, our attire now typifies this great country as we sell Americana all over the world. As I go walking one morn for pleasure, I find a puncher a rhino alone. His hands thrown back and his spurs a jingling, and as he approached, he was singing his song. Tucson is typical of Arizona's many lovely cities, a delightful blending of old Mexico and the clean, sunny sweep of modern growth in the desert sands. Old Tucson, just outside the city, is not old at all. It was originally built in 1940 by a major Hollywood movie studio as a typical western town. Numerous movies have been filmed here, such as Winchester 73 with Jimmy Stewart, McClintock with Jim Wayne, Rio Bravo, and many others. Today, Old Tucson is an amusement attraction full of reminders of the old frontier. They've recreated the old Lost Dutchman mine, and you can explore it for just a few cents, or you can ride shotgun on a real, bona fide, genuine Western coach. Old Tucson has a sheriff, and several times a day, the poor chap takes a terrible beating. Here we go! Go whoppy! The spectators are appalled, but shortly thereafter, justice triumphs and the heroic sheriff has his revenge.
everybody deserves a hand, gee whiz. But have you ever known an actor, even a villain, who could resist applause? After the performance, some pictures for the folks back home. America has hundreds of wax museums, and one of the very best is the American Heritage Wax Museum in fashionable Scottsdale, Arizona. The Spanish costume is not misleading. This wax figure belongs in a Western museum, the explorer Coronado. Coronado's compatriot and friend, the Franciscan friar, Marcos de Niza. One of the most incredible Indians in American history, the Apache Geronimo. With only 40 followers, he defied 5,000 federal troops and 500 Indian scouts for five fantastic years. Wild Bill Hickok and Calamity Jane. Now Buffalo Bill and Annie Oakley. The preacher's son who tried to prove that crime does pay, Jesse James. The face of the professional gunman, tough as they came, Johnny Ringo. One of the many bars at Old Tombstone is recreated here, and among the patrons are Bat Masterson, Doc Holliday, and Wyatt Earp. In real life, not all he was cracked up to be. Tombstone, the town too tough to die, has managed to stay remarkably alive and remains to this day one of the best preserved of old western towns. The new county courthouse was built in 1882 and is the oldest territorial courthouse in Arizona. It's now a state monument and museum. In every way imaginable, Tombstone tries to retain the color and flavor of its heyday. Tombstone's most famous attraction is the legendary O.K. Corral, so legendary that some people think Hollywood made it up. Since 1913, the O.K. Corral has been owned by Mr. Sid Wilson, a man in his 80s. He knew Wyatt Earp and describes the actual gunfight at the corral. It's taking place in the back end of the O.K. Corral at that gate you see back there. The Clanton and McLarry boys had saddled their horses inside the corral and were leaving town by the back way. The Earps were waiting for them at outside of the back gate. And the gunfight started as two of the boys had already led their horses through the gate. The third one, which was Tom McLarry, was right in the gate when the Earps opened fire on him. Tom McLarry was killed instantly by Doc Holliday with a double-barrel shotgun. His brother Frank fell just outside of the gate about 15 feet. Billy Clanton staggered clear to the street behind, which is Fremont Street, before he fell with seven bullet holes in him. He was still alive and picked up and carried across the street to Doc Goodfellow's office where he died about 20 minutes later. Mr. Wilson, do you think that Tombstone really deserves the bad reputation that has endured through the years? Who had the bad reputation? Tombstone would have been considered a Sunday school alongside of some of the mining camps throughout the West. Several in Arizona was far tougher than Tombstone ever was as a tough town. Well, Tombstone was tough enough. Virgil Earp was shot and crippled for life here in 1881, and the next year his brother Morgan was killed while playing pool. This antique hearse transported the victims of gunplay, fair or foul, to the inevitable resting place at Boot Hill, also legendary, but also very much real. And here at Boot Hill, the markers tell luridly fascinating short stories. Margarita, stabbed by Gold Dollar. Rook, shot by Chinaman. Marshall White, shot by Curly Bill. Stinging Lizard, shot by Cherokee Hall. Three-fingered Jack Dunlop, shot by Jeff Milton. Some were legally hanged. Murder was as common as sunlight, and here's proof that lynchings really took place, just as in TV westerns. 
This poetic epitaph tells the sad tale of Lester Moore, four slugs from a 44, no less and no more. You'll find them all here at Tombstone, tall tales and true, on your Arizona, are typical of the Arizona that greeted Coronado and the Conquistadores almost 400 years ago. And yet these pictures were taken only weeks ago. Much of Arizona remains as Coronado saw it, rugged, primitive, seemingly beyond the reach of civilization. And yet there is beauty here in this tough terrain. Some people say you have to be a romantic to appreciate this kind of beauty, but I don't think so. Have you and I become so sophisticated that we can't marvel at saguaro cactus that can grow seemingly without water for 200 years? Well, some of these cacti are that old. The seemingly lifeless desert abounds with life. The scorpion is poisonous, the bite is painful but not fatal, and the same can be said of the giant tarantula and the Gila monster, the only poisonous lizard in America. Contact with these creatures may give you an awful headache, but rarely will the meeting prove fatal. Of course, the diamondback rattler is something else again. Be smart and be a coward. Run just as fast as you can. To really appreciate the desert and its flora and fauna, drive south of Phoenix about 100 miles to the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. The admission price is only about a dollar for adults, less for teenagers, and there's no charge for youngsters. Now, our armchair visit will be brief, but you can spend half a day here or more without getting bored at what is probably the finest desert museum in the world. The youngsters will be attracted by the impish groundhogs, and the desert tortoise is so harmless that even the children are invited to pet him. Don't let his looks deceive you. He loves to be pampered. The museum features walk-in bird cages, and once inside, you'll get the once-over from the chachalaca, a bird native to Mexico. This is the Western Roadrunner, the largest member of the cuckoo family. He can fly, but prefers the ground. The turkey vulture will spread its wings to absorb the morning sunshine. These are Cotamundi, or Chulo, closely related to the raccoon family, and the restless, fleet-footed jaguar. Mr. Hal Grau, the noted expert on desert wildlife, lectures at the Sonora Desert Museum, and here he's discussing the wild pig, or javelina, which is found from southern Arizona to South America. Reputedly, the wild pig is dangerous. Supposedly, it attacks people. But listen. Well, we think that sometimes, maybe this is what happens. The wild pigs are very nearsighted, and they're also very nosy. And they go out in the desert, and they grow to be 50 pounds, which is about three times as big as this fellow that I'm holding. And they hear a noise. They go to investigate the noise being made by some people. The people see a 50-pound pig coming toward them, so they run. The pig catches up to the noise that he's chasing. The people, out of fear, kick at the pig. The pig, to protect himself, bites at the people. And then the people go up a tree. When they come down out of the tree, they go home and tell everyone that the wild pig chased them up a tree. Now, this might be an oversimplification, but we think it happens in many of the instances. The main idea that we try to put across here is that if we leave the wild animals alone, we ask the children what will they do, and they answer, they'll leave us alone. Right? Isn't that right? Yes, that is. <laughs> Generally speaking, the Desert Museum discourages people from trying to make pets out of wild animals on the basis that they retain some of the wild instincts and you never know when they're going to show up. We try to condition the animals so that they can be held. For example, this two-year-old bobcat seems perfectly contented here. Her ears are up, her claws are in. She might be growling or purring at the moment, but watch what really happens to her when she gets milk or food on her mind. Now here's the wild cat, and here's the milk, and, and here we go. So you see, she still is quite wild. We are driving now through northeastern Arizona, 
Monument Valley and the main homestead of the Navajo Indians. Our guide is Mr. Bernie Marr, an Indian trader for many years, and a man who speaks the Navajo tongue fluently. These four-wheel drive vehicles are the only sure way to get into and out of the valley, because only the first seven miles of road into the Navajo Monument Valley are open to ordinary vehicles. Remember that. Bernie's tours are bouncy because of the terrain, and from start to finish, the trip will cover 90 rugged miles. But the scenery alone is worth the effort. Suddenly, absolutely suddenly, we'll pass several Navajo youngsters, regally mounted and with the finest trappings. They look at us with amusement. They're not on exhibition, we are. For this was their land long before Coronado and John Smith and the Pilgrims. You'll see this throughout the Navajo Nation. A Navajo returning to his hogan, his small castle of mud and clay that he calls home. The horse can shift for himself, where can he go? But the precious saddle is taken inside the Hogan. To my way of king, this is the one golden picture every sightseer to Monument Valley should take back home as a reminder of the Navajo Nation. Navajo women shepherds returning with their flock of sheep in the late afternoon. Now, if you were to see this in a movie, you would say, how lovely, how indescribably charming. But to see it for yourself, to realize that it isn't make-believe, that's what makes this everyday Navajo custom seem so memorable. From the wool of the sheep, the women card and spin yarn, and from the yarn, they hand loom the Navajo blankets treasured throughout the world, possibly the finest of all Indian woven goods in the Americas. And as we all know, the pattern is never the same. No two Navajo blankets are identical. In the summer months, when the days are long and the last meal has ended, the Navajo women will gather in front of the Hogan and take turns grooming and knotting each other's hair. The comb, by the way, is made from dried grass found in the desert. The Navajo women have beautiful hair, almost jet black until old age, and very thick and naturally oily. Montezuma Castle in central Arizona is one of the most interesting and best preserved cliff dwellings in the USA. The castle has no connection with the Aztec emperor whose name it bears. The castle dwelling was named after Montezuma by early Arizona settlers who believed it had been built by refugees fleeing from the Aztec Empire at the time of the Spanish conquest. And this modern drawing of Montezuma Castle shows how elaborately and ingeniously it was built into the cliffs. The Indian inhabitants of this enormous dwelling were peaceful farmers, and as best as archaeologists can determine, they settled here between 1100 and 1400 A.D. Where they came from and where they went, we do not know. Well, the long summer ends, the days grow shorter, and this Navajo lady hurries to her own Hogan before the shadows fall. No holiday in Arizona could possibly be complete without a stopover at the state's most famous natural wonder, and rated by many the number one natural wonder on the face of the earth. Of course, this is the Grand Canyon, a mile-deep gorge averaging 10 miles from rim to rim, a gorge created in the space of countless millenniums by the slow, steady cutting of the Colorado River. Quite truthfully, you can spend at least several weeks in Grand Canyon National Park and still not see all that is worth seeing. But here now is something that relatively few sightseers have ever seen a roaring, screaming, blinding blizzard on the slopes of the Grand Canyon. Once the howling blizzard has subsided, the canyon resembles New England at Christmas time.
Notice here that while one rim of the canyon is covered with snow, there's hardly any snow at all on the opposite rim, which incidentally is farther away than it looks, about five or six miles at this particular spot. Finally, in late spring, as late as May, the stubborn snows can no longer resist the rising temperature. The Hopi Indians who live in the Grand Canyon country celebrate the approaching warm weather. Here is the Hopi feather dance. Hopi Hoop Dance. If you can spare a day or two and have a spirit of adventure, Here's a fine way to explore the Grand Canyon from the river bank to the rims. There are numerous day-long and overnight pack trips with excellent guides and well-established trails and stops. You will be rewarded with views that are honestly without parallel, for nowhere else on earth is there a second Grand Canyon. It's quite a place for a holiday, the state of Arizona. There is a ruggedness here, a loveliness here, a feeling of friendship here, that combines into a package of colorful memories. History, culture, wildlife, entertainment, grandeur, they're all here awaiting you on your Arizona holiday. <laughs>